Hello. Oh, it is recording. I see the little figure. Okay, great. I will do my little spiel and then I'll introduce you. Nice. Okay, here I go. Hi, this is Sue from the Salveson Mind Room Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh. And we are recording another podcast episode, just trying to um, take advantage maybe of the interest that there is at the moment in child development and well-being and so on and see if we can add to that conversation in a useful way. And today I'm talking to Holly Joseph, who is a very dear old friend of mine, as well as being an associate professor of language education and literacy development at the Institute of Education at the University of Reading. Hello, Holly. Hello. Very long <laughs> title I have there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got to give you all your credit for all of oh, your uh, hard work yeah. that you've done to get there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Holly, we are going to talk about your paper that was looking at incidental word learning during reading in children. So this is, I guess, how children learn new words while they're reading. Exactly. Um, perfect. Glad I've understood that correctly. It's a good start. So tell me, what did you find when you were doing this study? What did you discover? Well, I mean, very simply, we discovered that children do learn new words um, as they're reading. So this is words, they're not trying to learn them on purpose. It's not deliberate. It's just as they're reading, do they kind of pick up information about um, the meaning of the word? So children can do this. They can learn um, about both the spelling and the meaning um, of words. Um, but I guess the most interesting finding was that children differ quite a lot in how efficient they are in doing this and how efficient they are in learning these new word meanings. And so I guess if you're thinking about educational relevance or um, practical um, implications, I guess this shows that children, well, what we found was that children who we know were already not so good at reading comprehension in general, those children, um, so-called poor comprehenders, were slower and less successful at learning these new word meanings. Mm. So it's going to have a kind of um, a, a, a snowball, a negative kind of a cycle of effect, right, in terms of acquiring exactly. new words as well. Exactly, right. yeah. yeah. So, so these, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, go on. I was just going to say these sort of, we call them Matthew um, effects. So the idea of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So right. if, um, if you're already good at reading, then you kind of get more out of reading, learn more vocabulary. And then if you've got a better vocabulary, it's, hard, it's easier for you to understand text. And that kind of goes on and on. And then there's right. the, the other side. If you're poor at reading, it's harder for you to learn new words. And then it's harder for you to read new um, text, so over time, the difference between those two groups of children increases. I see. Yeah, that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why, so it's interesting, you started off by saying that, you know, you discovered that children learn new words while reading, right? So that's, it's one of those findings in science where I think people probably listening want to be like, uh, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you, can you sort of explain a bit about what we knew already and, and what, you know, why, what motivated you to, to be asking this question in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I should say that we didn't discover that. We, knew, <laughs> we already knew that children learn new words um, through reading. And in fact, from around age nine onwards, most of the new words we learn, we learn through reading them in context. Um, rather than sort of deliberately trying to learn them or being taught them in a classroom, for example. Um, and I guess we were interested in the process of that. So right. I don't know, it might be useful to think about an example. So let's say the word benign. The first time you encounter the word benign, you might encounter it in, the, in a medical context, so something to do with a benign tumour, right? So that first context that you encounter it, it in will give you a little bit of information about the meaning of the word tumour, but it's not the whole story. So what you need is then to um, encounter benign again and then again in varied contexts. And over time, you might hear about, you might read about a benign leader or benign weather. And over time, you start to extract the kind of core meaning of that mm -hmm. word as something like harmless. And that means, you know, your, your knowledge of that word increases and you're able to then use it yourself 
in productive language though in your, mm. in your in your speaking and your writing so we knew we already knew that children did this and that they did it a lot so around two to three thousand words a year are learned this way from around eight wow. i know that's amazing you know, isn't it um um but what we don't know is is, is how that happens the kind of process by which right. that happened um and so we were interested in okay what happens the first time you see a new word in context and then the second time and then the third time and so on and so on and what can we see in terms of the kind of development of understanding of that word um meaning so we wanted to look at the process we already knew it happened but we didn't know how it happened and we also right. didn't know what conditions might be the most helpful for word learning um in this way to occur and which children might find it particularly hard okay this is great so so how so that's really helpful context and now i'm curious about how you went about measuring that so did you have to give them how did you know that they didn't already know the words, for example? Did you give them made up words or, you know, what, yeah. what was the process? I mean, we've done a few studies like this. So in this study, we used real words. There's lots of um, arguments for the for and against using real versus um, made up words. So obviously, if you use made up words, the children will never have encountered those before. Um, mm. But if you use the, the ethical issues around um, you know, having children read many times these made up words. So we used very rare um, um, real words, which were all actually past tense verbs, so things like confabulated and languished. And these were children in years five and six, so they were kind of nine to 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and what we wanted to do was kind of recreate what happens in the real world when people kind of just read independently and encounter words that they don't know recreate that within a kind of controlled experiment so we we, we created these kind of sentence frames or contexts and we had um six i think it was um of these target rare words and each of them had 10 contexts so you sort of have the first time you um encountered it would give you some information about its meaning and the second time third time etc um, and so there were 60 sentences in total across these six um, mm -hmm. these six words. Um, and so children read these 60 sentences over the course of two days. Um, and we used an eye tracker to track their eye movement as they read. Um, and the reason we did this was to try and get at the process that I was talking about. So mm -hmm. we know from eye movement research that the longer you look at a word or, or a phrase, the harder it is for you to process. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so we thought we might see this interesting pattern over the course of these 10 different presentations of each word that what the first time children saw it, they'd take a long time to read it because it was unfamiliar and difficult to understand. And then the second time they did spend a little bit less time and so on and so on. Um, and in this way, we could kind of map children's learning trajectories of these individual words and find out something. Mm -hmm interesting um, and, and that's how we made the conclusion that poor comprehenders were less efficient at um, learning these new words because their reduction in reading time was much less dramatic than the children with better reading comprehension skills right right so did those um poor comprehenders did did everyone start out reading sort of slowly to the to the same you know but they all equally slow the first time they read confabulated and then it was just that the the confident readers got got super fast by the time it was the tenth time or yeah. or was there a difference right at the very beginning i mean, I, I should say actually i've sort of slightly been confusing that we didn't actually have a group of poor comprehenders and right right, right yeah. we just had children with varying Reading sure. comprehension. So sure. not everybody was the same, but everybody was within a margin of kind of 200 yeah. milliseconds, yeah. um, and everybody very, very consistently reduced um, their reading times. So if you look at it on a graph, you basically just see this relatively steep um, slope down for the um, for, for everybody. Um, yeah. But if you kind of show it in the graph with the kind of worst comprehenders versus the best comprehenders, you can see a much uh, less steep slope for the poor, yeah. poorer yeah. comprehenders. And so this is something that maybe you didn't look at, but I'm curious about. So you, you talked when you were giving the benign example at the beginning, mm. obviously the other words that benign is paired with are a big part of revealing the meaning of the word benign, right? Yeah. And therefore, I guess, contributing to this faster reading. 
So, you know, benign tumor, benign leader, benign weather, et cetera. So yeah. did you look at patterns of how they were looking at the words around the kind of target word, the new word? You know, was there some maybe looking back and forth or anything like that? Or, do, or is reading just not really subject to those kinds of effects? I'm, I'm not, I don't know you, it well enough. You absolutely can do that. We didn't do that in okay. the study. We have subsequently done another study where we had kind of clue words, which we controlled um, for various uh -huh. Things and so then you can look at how long they look at the clue word and how long they look at the target word. Um, I mean, the difficulty with eye tracking is that you have to control. If you've got target words, you've got to control them for length and frequency and various other things. Yeah. You don't want the longer reading times to be influenced by one of those variables that we know have huge impact on reading times. So it's very very hard to have these multiple. Um, regions of interest a while making sure that they're controlled um yeah. so yeah I, I don't know if they were looking i mean i, I guess we made the assumption that if they're looking less time at the word they're looking at the rest of the sentence more although that's not necessarily the case so yeah in, the, right. in this study we can't really speak to that yeah. unfortunately yeah, yeah. i love this about reading research though because you and i shared an office where we were doing mm -hmm. our PhDs, right? And I remember, you know, having to make up impossible sentences and <laughs> unlikely sentences, right? So you'd have you'd have the man played the guitar, that would be a, a normal sentence, and then you'd have yeah. I don't know the dog played the guitar, so that'd be like an unlikely sentence, and then yeah. you know the house played the guitar, which would be an impossible sentence. But it was it's so yeah. fun, right? Do you enjoy yeah. that part of your job? I or love it, that part. I I, I actually really love. Um, also trying to find words that are the same length and the same frequency and the same age of acquisition and the same concreteness and the same all these things you have to think about that fit into a sentence. I mean, it does yeah. result in some really weird sentences. So you, I'm sure you know the really famous uh, one. It's about um, sort of grammatical processing, not vocabulary, about the horse ra raced past the barn fell. Do you know that one? No. So this is incredibly hard for people to understand. Stand, um, but it does actually make sense. The horse raced past the bar. I don't understand it. Can you? <laughs> That's probably because you're a good comprehender and you have. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so so people when they see that they assume that the verb raced is um, an active verb. So the horse is doing the racing, but actually yeah. in this sentence it's passive. So if you sort of you know, uh, made it longer, you could say the horse that was raced past the barn, brackets, by the jockey, fell. No. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So the horse is falling, not the barn. <laughs> oh, yes, no, the barn's not falling. Yeah, because um, I was, I just thought the horse raced past, comma, the barn fell. Like, that was the best attempt uh, I could make okay. at making sense of it. Like, yeah. it was just too, too separate events anyway yeah, it's, yeah i guess that's yeah. an interesting distinction between oral language and written language right because you couldn't have that right. in written language without a comma or a semicolon i don't even know what yeah. the yeah. punctuation would be whereas in 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 spoken language you can kind of insert your own punctuation to try and help you make sense yeah i think my brain's desperately putting in punctuation to help you. <laughs> <laughs> um oh well this is great and so you touched at the beginning on the kind of implications of this you know in the the, the kind of rich get richer, poor get poorer effect here. So mm -hmm. I guess the question for, you know, maybe parents, obviously, at home, homeschooling and, and teachers, you know, um, thinking about their practice when, when whenever that um, is permitted to return to normal again. What, what can we do about that? Is there any way that we can sort of reverse these effects or take account of them in the way that we um, encourage children with their reading and support their reading? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, because in some ways, the findings from this study are, are a bit negative, because, I mean, mm. on the basis of this study, ne ne there's nothing specific that I could mm. recommend. Um, I mean, what I think it, I mean, it, we know that that reading for pleasure is important, right? And schools are, you know, really promoting this, and quite rightly, we all know as parents that we should be encouraging our children to read. If we have young children, we should be reading storybooks to them. We all know that. 
Mm. Um, and I wouldn't put a second question the benefits of independent reading. But I guess for, for teachers and parents, potentially, it's just worth remembering that, that, that reading is likely to benefit some children more than others. Mm. And those who mm. already struggle may need additional support mm. in order to gain mm. the same advantage. I mean, one obvious way off the top of my head, not based on research, to support a child who we know already has reading comprehension difficulties is to pre-teach vocabulary or, or yeah. at least you know sort of be aware that some of the words um that they're going to encounter are going to be difficult for them but you know if yeah. we're talking about independent reading which is what i am talking about you know how how, how do you do that it it, it requires mm. a lot of intervention mm. from a third party mm. so mm. so it's tricky um, yeah, but I think, I mean, I think you're right. Just being cognizant of the difficulties is a really important part of the puzzle, right? Yeah. And yeah. just being, you know, patient and understanding with people who, um, whose reading progress is maybe going to be that bit slower, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess as well, I'm always interested in the debate about sort of the role of things like audio book, right? Mm -hmm. But off the top of my head, not in any way an expert in this area it seems to me that perhaps acquiring new vocabulary for someone who's struggling with the mechanics of reading might work better yeah. you know it might be easier when it's an audio book right because you can then yeah. take the time to dwell on the new meanings of the words that you're encountering without the hurdle of of, of kind of interpreting what's on the page Does yeah that, i mean i think i think audio books are a fantastic resource for children with a dyslexic profile because if right. what's hard for you is decoding is, is yeah. efficiently recognizing and accurately reading words then a you're probably not going to like reading um and b you're going to sort of miss read words or not be able to read words and that's going to have um, a detrimental effect on your understanding mm. although if you have dyslexia by definition you don't have a problem with understanding language but rather with as you say the mechanics of reading with a poor yeah. comprehender it's kind of different right because a poor comprehender is somebody who has um accurate and fluent word reading so they don't have difficulty kind of you know the um reading words quickly and correctly yeah. but yeah. um their difficulty is in understanding language and we know right, now it's right. not just written language it's language so poor comprehenders tend to have poor vocabulary and they tend to be poor at comprehending language and we see that that often becomes very apparent in late primary school because it's right. harder to see somebody who hasn't got a sort of more significant language um impairment it's yeah. harder to see you know when they're very young um so so for those children arguably audio books are not they might help a little bit because you've got these sort of added clues of prosody and you know using the voice to um you know to emphasize meaning etc yeah but yeah. in in theory at least audio books would be thought right. to be more helpful for a child with a sort of dyslexic rather than poor comprehender yeah. profile right. it's just really hard to to, mm. to help these children um because it's really hard to improved vocabulary and high level reading comprehension skills um mm -hmm. i have got one little happy <laughs> aspect to this research i was not actually yeah give us, give us the so, happy aspect. <laughs> um is that we ran a similar study with children who speak english as an additional language and so those children tend to look a bit like poor comprehenders in english so they tend to have lower vocabulary than monolingual uh children and they um tend to struggle with reading comprehension but be fine at word reading so they're accurate um, and fluent so these children who on paper kind of look like poor comprehenders but they're not really poor comprehenders right they're just sort of relatively new to english and have had less mm. exposure to the english language these children seem to be particularly good particularly efficient at learning new words through reading in a mm. very similar design so comparing them with non-poor comprehender monolingual children their reduction over the course of the exposures was much steeper so wow. it's not just if you've not got so much vocabulary and reading comprehension skills you're kind of you know <laughs> i can't think of a word that's not a swear word you're in trouble um <laughs> it's, not, it's, <laughs> it's not that um 
so we see that that's another reason why we have to be we have it's complicated and as a teacher practitioner parent you know it's not a kind of if this then this but rather different groups of children to different degrees might be able to benefit more or less from independent reading uh, this is such juicy stuff i feel like we're going to have to do a second follow-up podcast because i've got so many more questions i want to ask you about the category of poor comprehenders but i'm going to force myself to start for now and just end by asking you whether you have any um pearls of wisdom for the students and early career researchers and so on who might be listening who are you know um perhaps uh dealing with derailed research plans uncertain futures and so on so what what would you like to say to them um so i mean i haven't listened to other podcast in the series which I probably should have done because probably everyone else has said this as well but um you know academia can be a really strange world and and during this crisis I've seen lots of tweets from academics talking about how productive they're being during lockdown mm. and what an opportunity this is to catch up with writing and grant applications um but at the same time there were others who were struggling to get any work done due to caring for children or other people or for other reasons and so I, I kind of, I knew you were going to ask me this, and I thought, what would I say to myself, you know, 10, 15 years ago? And I think I would say, try to ignore what other people are doing and find mm. a path that works for you. So you can have a successful academic career without working more than 40 hours a week. You don't have to work evenings and weekends. You can prioritize family and friends and free time over work. And it's okay to do that. Of course, it's also fine for people who genuinely want to work more than 60 hours a week and, and you know their first love is their research and they prioritize that over everything of course that's fine too um but you don't have to do, be like that um and i think it's it can be really hard to remember that particularly if you're at a sort of very you know high achieving institution where people are incredibly successful and it doesn't look, when you look around, it doesn't look like anybody's going home at 5.30 to, you know, make dinner for their family or, you know, nobody's taking an entire weekend off to go skiing or, or whatever um, um, whatever they like to do in their free time. And, and, and I think that if more people, you know, thought about why they got into it in the first place, thought about their passion for research, not for publishing and bringing in money because I mean who starts in academia because they've got a passion for <laughs> publishing and bringing in money you know if more of us sort of remembered that then maybe academia would be a li bit less scary and a bit more welcoming for for you know people just starting off um in this weird world we live in <laughs> oh that is not just a pearl of wisdom I'm going to say that that's a diamond of wisdom that's really <laughs> It's a really excellent and beautifully put point. I mean, cool. if more people did what you have done, Sue, and said, "What? Is it, what is it? Your radical no to these a yeah, requests?" A year, a year of saying no. Yeah. yeah. Well, I also broke my own rules a few times, Holly. So I don't know if we should hold me up as an <laughs> But I mean, just, just, just trying. I mean, I'm sure yeah. it had an impact on both your work, but also on the other parts of your life which are important and yeah we need to yeah. remind ourselves of that yeah absolutely absolutely and it's been good practice I think I've got better at saying no which is a skill mm. that it is worth developing yeah. um because yeah. it's because not it easy takes, to do it, yeah no exactly it mm. takes confidence and that's hard mm. when you're just starting out and you look mm. around you and mm. nobody seems to be saying no mm. so yeah mm. say no that's my pearl of wisdom say no <laughs> <laughs> be like Sue <laughs> 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 well, thank you very much, Holly, for your time. Um, this is a real well. cracker. And for anyone who's listening, you'll be able to find out more about Holly's work and the work specifically we talked about today by following the links that we'll put on the podcast page, which is at ed.ac.uk forward slash Salveson dash research. Thank you very much, Holly. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, we did it. I thought that went quite smoothly.